In southern New South Wales, we're fairly, fairly new to this uh, no-till caper. Uh, I guess our systems have been mixed farming based, but uh, we're now seeing emergence of, um, of uh, I guess, uh, I guess an intense um, cropping system and, and some continuous cropping systems. But we, um, yeah, we, we sort of come up with an idea in collaboration with some other people is to, to look at some of the ways that we can look at herbicides uh, more efficiently in, um, in no-till systems. So I'll acknowledge Kiralee, my wife, who's a business partner with me. Um, she obviously does a lot of the, um, the data analysis and, and presentation work here as well. So the project overview, and we've seen the rapid adoption of, of no-till, as, as, as you all know, um, in southern New South Wales in particular. Stubble retention is a bit uh, a later concept coming into the play on the back of dry years and a, a growing awareness of water use efficiency. So, um, you look at some of the, the GRDC funded work, particularly in the water use efficiency area, and uh, the, the farmer interest in that, in that sort of work is, is sky high. So we, um, we were sort of seeing an evolution of seeding systems. So you just think where we've come from in, in 10 to 15 years from a majority of people using combines at full cutout to, um, to uh, knife point press wheels on, on auto steers. So it's a pretty short time frame when you really think about it. In my short working career, um, that change has happened in a, in a short period of time. Uh, and sort of linked in with that is this shift towards pre-emergent herbicides. So uh, Steve's uh, outline this morning was excellent, I thought, as to how the pre-emergent herbicides have evolved with their uh, no-till um, their no-till system in WA and, and as, as we learnt from um, Chris in South Australia how they can make it work better and, and how we've got to be aware of it. So we're actually quite fortunate as we don't have that level of resistance but still we've got to learn how to use them properly. So um, knife point press wheel has evolved to the point where a lot of us now on label. So that's, that's how confident the industry has become with that, with that technique. Uh, bring in the one on left field and that's disc seeders. So we're seeing interest in disc seeders from, from growers, uh, again for that pursuit of water use efficiency and there's pros and cons with them. So we came up with a lot of questions but um, from our perspective uh, we, we sort of found there was, there was limited, limited answers. So GRDC through the Agribusiness Extension Network funding, uh, we, we put up an application to run this one year uh, project and it was a great example of, of collaborative research. It was just fantastic. There's so many people in the melting pot. GRDC funded, we led it. Uh, Kiralee wrote the, the project application. Agritech New South Wales were fantastic. They are based out of Young here, did all the, all the groundwork. I see Tony Single sitting in front of me, and Nick Amos, Peter Hamblin. And then we had some, some growers who pushed the, pushed the whole system. Um, we always tend to think advisors are at the top of the tree, but really we're just bottom feeders off these growers. And you just, they're the ones really trying to, to push the envelope and, and get the most out of it from a profit basis, but also um, how to make this, this system work year in, year out. And then we'll, we had support too from, from the chemical companies, which were very grateful with Bayer and New Farmers Syngenta, who were keen to be involved in this work, because uh, they see it as independent. Uh, that was a big part of it. And FarmLink Research as well as a growing, uh, a grow group who, uh, who are pretty active in southern New South Wales. So the, the objective's pretty clear, we just want to compare disc and time um, across three sites and uh, we're looking at wheat on wheat into stubble. So in terms of some of the uh, rotation issues and things, we, we broke a few rules but we we're trying to just uh, get, get an actual results um, with, with extreme situations. So we're looking at grass weed control and as, you, as most of the people in this room, post-emergent options, particularly for ryegrass, are, are non-existent. So pre-emergent is the dominant form of weed control. Um, it's quite a unique design, which uh, I'll credit Pete Hamblin with. We had a meeting one day and we wanted grower equipment to um, actually get the, 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 uh, the, the soil throw that you need and the seed placement, but we still want to replicate the plots because if you can't do any statistical analysis, the data's demonstrations, are, you sort of read books of them all the time. It's just useless data because it, it's not repeatable. So he came up with a design where we had replicated plots using it's a 10 metre boom, which Tony corrects me, but it, it sort of brought back to six metre width. So they would spray through the plots with the, um, with the, the, the ute, a split, split sort of uh, plot design, and then the, the grower machinery would then sort of do the, do the strips through the, through the plots. And we really got a great result with, with the, using the grower seeders um, you know, to mimic the soil throw and, and to look at the speed. And we had a range of soil conditions at the time of sowing. And then we're really coming down with this disc and tine, comparing crop safety, uh, our weed control and, and yield, which we didn't get on all the plots, but I'll explain that. So the treatments, and uh, before I go into these, 
Um, as you see in the paper, a lot of these are not registered for disk use number one, or some are not registered IBS in New South Wales pre-emergence. So there's quite a big <coughs> caution warning under that. There was a research purposes only. Um, so just be a bit wary of, of these products, not, not for commercial use. So we had an industry standard of something like Trifler at 1.5, and, and then we have got some of this new chemistry that Chris was talking about this morning, the box of gold um, with, uh, with additional Avidex Extra, and then Secura, which is a new product which will be available next year from Bayer. And then we had standard sort of mixes that, that most of you people are probably using uh, in, your, in your IBS no-till system. So um, there's nothing too surprising there. And, and New Farm for, had a good suggestion with that Triflorex and Avidex Extra, two litres of each. Um, so just some of the, some of the, the options. And, and as you say, there's probably another 10 options on top of that that you could add. But um, nothing, they, they were sort of deemed to be appropriate mixes. So we had um, three sites, uh, sorry, Wagga, which is actually just north of Wagga, a place called Downside, Lockhart and Grenfell. So the Wagga site was a, a, a medium sort of to heavy red earth, a, a reasonably uh, well structured soil. The Lockhart soil was actually on a, um, a quartz ridge uh, and the Grenfell site was on a fairly light, light loam. So different soil types, but really not, not, that, not that light in terms of soil type. But, um, we're trying to get a range of different seeding equipment and, and three different areas, which really worked well last year given the outcome of the season. At the Wagga site, we, um, just more because of logistics, but we sowed the wedge star wheat on the 13th of April, which was um, pretty early, but it was just the way it worked out with the disc seeder going away to do other jobs and things, so we had to fit in with the growers. The tine was a pretty standard um, horde bagshaw with nucky press wheels where you've got the, the seed placement actually operating off the, um, off the press wheel. So it's a poor man's conserver pack to some degree. And uh, he's on um, what most people would deem a fairly wide row spacing at 375 mil, so it's 15 inch. The disc is a straightforward single disc, an XL on a, a 10 inch 250 mil row spacing. So the, the conditions at that trial site were pretty good. Um, we had good solid subsoil moisture um, and it all, uh, it all went in quite well. Lockhart was Lincoln, sown uh, ideal window, the 14th of May. Um, it was a, a tricky site and we had to actually sow across the sowing runs because the, um, it, there was a patchy burn on the paddock, it's just the way it worked out. The header driver of a, a contractor for the year before had really wide tyres for some odd, odd reason. So in terms of stubble handling, it's just a nightmare. So it was burnt by the grower and we sowed across it. So the tine was a, a janky setup with press wheels on a flexicool bar. 12 inch, 300 mils, and the disc again was a single disc, John Deere. So, and Grenfell is, is the, uh, it's a real interesting one where we've got the most results out of this whole work, but it was Livingston, sown on the 20th of May. The soil was, um, it was wet enough. It was obviously pretty well close to field capacity when the tr crop was sown. 20th of May, the tine was a hoard bag shore. It wasn't actually on press wheels. It's what they call a Ryan press harrow, which, probably gives you a little bit more crop damage in, in my opinion than what you would get out of a press wheel and if anyone um, has other experiences with it. Um, he was on 14 inch, 350 mil and the disc is a different compared to the other disc, it's a daybreak disc on a 15 inch row spacing. So very little soil disturbance as well. And he'd um, actually taken off the boot scrapers that can operate on that machine to throw a bit more soil. So, um, so now the results, it was, um, Really surprising what came out of it all. We sort of see, um, yeah, we, we sort of see the beauty of having three sites and, and three different systems as to get some pretty spectacular results. Um, the different outcomes were sort of mainly due to the weed density, uh, the soil moisture, and the stubble loads. So nothing new, but there are also little things that go into the jigsaw to, to working out how how you're going to make some of these uh, pre-emergent herbicides work in a no-till situation. So nothing surprising. Uh, the tine cedar produced consistently better establishment and early crop vigour, but uh, it's still, at, at two of the other sites, the Wagga and the Lockhart site, that really made no difference to the end result. The early vigour and dry matter was better, um, plant counts were better, but at the end of the day, um, it didn't, didn't really contribute to sort of yield or, or final sort of weed control options. So, and that's, that's a big learning curve that most of you who are dealing with this seed of clients are probably understanding that, that, that early, early biomass and dry matter doesn't always have a big bearing on the final um, yield results, but it certainly has a bearing on crop competition 
Um, uh, so at Wagga, 50% stubble cover. The locusts belted the hell out of it. Tony single sprayed it twice. Um, yeah, that, and it was interesting where the disc seed are slower, bigger to come out of the ground. The, 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 the locusts just hammered the disc treatment. So uh, it was early sown, very high ryegrass numbers, uh, up to 190 plants per square metre. And we fallowed that trial site in the spring. We had good weed data off it. We weren't prepared to take it through to harvest. And uh, it was yeah, fallowed out and, and a double knock performed because we weren't prepared to leave that amount of ryegrass in that farmer's paddock for subsequent years. Uh, plant numbers were definitely higher in the time. We still didn't reach our target plant numbers. So we were obviously targeting 100 plus plants a square metre with the sowing rate we had. So even in the time establishments, it was a bit, a bit lower than what we targeted. Uh, 50 plants in the disc. What was interesting in the really high pressure site, the weed control, as you'll see with that, that table in, in the notes, there was really no difference between the disc and the tine across the majority of treatments. So you inherently think the tine is incorporating the pre-emergent herbicides better, but when the numbers came down to it, there was, it was not, the, not the great difference that you would expect. Um, the weakest, obviously, was the 1.5 litre of trifleur, but um, whatever, and the ryegrass at that site was susceptible. It's, we've since had it tested and from a paddock nearby. It's, not, not, it's potentially only developing resistance to group Bs and Cs, and, um, so it's, it's got pretty good susceptibility. Um, the, uh, the, the trifleur at 1.5 litres probably gave the weakest control, but all the others, even just putting low ground with the trifleur, up to your ryegrass control by 20 or 30 per cent. So it was a pretty, pretty easy target. But um, what was interesting, and it was a, a point raised by um, uh, Tony Single again from Agritech, was the residual control out of Secura, and sort of about what Chris was saying this morning, even till October. And none of the other products gave that length of control. You still had plots clean at following time in October from the Secura. So that was quite amazing at a fairly high ryegrass density site. We saw damage in the disc, but in the end at the final sort of biomass counts, it wasn't significant enough to sort of you know, warrant that um, you'd sort of think that's a real problem with that particular disc. Lockhart, this, this site was probably the easiest of the lot and, and just highlights um, what can happen with, with discs in dry conditions. Dry site at sowing, there was rain, um, the notes are actually wrong, there was probably rain a bit earlier than what I said in the notes, but it had that patchy burn, it got very wet, waterlogged in the winter spring, but the, the difference between the disc and time treatments was minimal. You had to really pick uh, the row spacing difference in the end by the springtime to determine which was a time and which was a disc. So that, that dry, dry establishment, there was little crop damage from the, uh, from the pre-emergent herbicides. The plant numbers were excellent, exactly what we targeted, a bit lower in the, um, in the tine, of course. Uh, they had some, some damage with the three litres of trifler in the disc, but at the end, uh, we did take this one through to harvest, there was no significant difference between yield in the disc or the tines. So, and that, that, that's, that was a good result, because it starts to sort of give you a, a bit of confidence in the sort of what the, the the si crop safety and the yield potential are with these pre-emergent herbicides under a disc. But as we found out, it's, um, yeah, different sites, different conditions cr create different results. Now Grenfell was, um, was the most extreme and really created the most interest and probably even shocked some of the trial collaborators as to what the impact of the, of the disc particularly and then the pre-emergent herbicides. So it was sown into a thick residue, it was a third year wheat on wheat. So again, in terms of commercial reality, pretty bad scenario. We saw yellow leaf spot issues and nitrogen deficiency in the winter. Um, the soil was fairly wet. It was 1,015 millimetres for the year. So um, what's that, 40 inches, those still delivering bags. Um, 650 mils from September to December. So it was a wet site, stayed wet all year. So in August, just from when we went back for another review of the site, it was totally wet. You, you were sort of going in below your ankles. And that was in August, just as the crop was starting to elongate. So it never really recovered. It had moderate weed pressure to begin with, and we, we were pretty confident it would go through to harvest. But because there was no crop competition at all, we followed that site as well. So we weren't prepared, or I wasn't prepared to leave that amount of ryegrass going back into that farmer's paddock. So Again, it was uh, fallowed out with glyphosate and then had a, a double knock. So we um, practice what we preach. But the, the low plant numbers were a real concern. So the, the wet soils, um, even the plant counts in the time were poor, 
but um, again, compared to target densities, but uh, the, the disc was terrible. We only started getting 30 plants per square metre, so just totally unacceptable. Um, the disc area was yeah, basically unable to recover during the spring. Um, the weed control, again, was equal between the disc and the tine, which, again, it surprises you. You think, oh, the, the, the tine would create more tilth, more crop competition, but actually the level of weed control between the disc and the tine was the same. So this will all be reported in a full report for GRDC by March. So those that are interested in the statistics, because there's been, um, Agritech have done statistics on all this in terms of ANOVAs, so that's all been analysed. But we had severe crop damage across all the herbicides. And, uh, and some estimated yields were done, and it was in terms of a profitability level for a, a potential yield, even in a wet year, uh, yeah, to sort of potentially getting one and a half tonne of a hectare in a year, we should have been getting five or six tonne, is pretty serious. So, um, and a lot of the herbicide companies visited the site and got good value out of it, so we, um, and just to, to, to I pulled this one out, and it's a crop bigger score, which is, um, it's again, it's a, a subjective visual measurement. Um, we do have plant counts, but it just sort of highlights the differences. And there's no particular herbicide. So you've got um, Secura, which is deemed um, yeah, very safe in the other two sites and all the other work we see from other states uh, and Barry Haskins' work. Uh, just the level of crop damage was just ridiculous in these trials. You were sort of, you barely um, coming up with sort of 10 or 15 plants a square metre in some of these plots that never recovered in the spring. Um, box of gold and Avidex was close to a fallow, so that was a pretty severe, severe result. Um, this one was, was pretty severe, the, the secure Avidex was probably the worst in some of the replicates early, but um, they actually recovered somewhat, so, um, so it didn't matter which of the herbicides, obviously um, they, they were all pretty active on the, on the crop in that. We're, we're low vigour and wet soil, low nitrogen, yellow leaf spot, it all sort of compounded to um, and you look at the time results and really they recovered quite nicely by August. So here's a picture, just uh, trifluralin at 1.5, low ground at 35 and diuron at uh, 500 grams uh, applied pre-sowing and incorporated by sowing. Um, that's, that was a, a, a photograph taken in July. So um, even with that level of stubble there, third year wheat on wheat, which is again breaking all the rules of rotation in commercial situations. But the tine, tine was coming through. It was just starting to get out of that yellow, yellow leaf spot sort of soup had been sitting in for two months and eventually grew, grew to recover. The poor old disc, it's, um, and every single plot was like this for those. Who actually went to the site? Did show of hands? Yeah, so, yeah, we've got plenty of people to back me up with what I'm saying here. It was pretty extreme. Um, so in summary, I mean, no-till is a proven system of crop management. We're not doubting that, and it's, it's going to continue to, to lift our, um, our water use efficiency in crop yields as our soil structure gets better and better. We can, handle, um, you know, we can handle wet and dry extremes. But weed management in that, in that system, particularly with no-till gear, is, is complex and it's risky. So, um, and, and I just think those people who are going into these systems, are particularly disc systems, have got to have a higher level of weed management than what they might have in the past. So it's not for the faint-hearted. It's easy to buy a machine, but to actually make it fit a system is, uh, is another step above. And I don't have all the answers, and I've actually got a couple of clients who have disc machines, and it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, not to say we're going to give up on them by any means, but it requires an understanding of, of the, the things like soil throw, soil moisture. So if we know now if you've got a full profile of moisture at sowing and you've got a disc seeder, we won't use any pre-emergent after what we learnt. But if it's dry, like from the lockout site which got wet afterwards, we've got confidence um, because if, if it's dry at start and you still get rain afterwards, you've got a bit of a buffer. If it's wet to begin with and you get wet afterwards, you've got no buffer. So, um, and row spacing has an influence as well. So. Um, yeah, there's the speed of sowing. The knife point press wheels are, are pretty common now. You see things like three litres of trifler for wheat registered in, uh, in knife point press wheels. And that's common practice. I don't know how well it's adopted in southern New South Wales. It's certainly done, um, you know, those growers that are, are in that more continuous cropping system. But crop safety and weed control is definitely a, a pretty massive issue with, with disc. And as I said at the start, a lot of these products are not registered in, in disc systems. And, um, after what some of the chemical companies saw this year, I don't think they'll be racing to get them all registered. But disc technology is evolving, and it's a bit like um, 
I, I, yeah, with, with herbicide resistance, you think, oh, we're buggered, you know, we're never going to come out of this. But I've, in a lot of our cropping scenarios now, we've got less ryegrass now than what we had 10 years ago. So it's just we've got to think smarter. And if we want to take advantages of the water use benefits, we get out of zero till. Because um, there are benefits, like that seed placement and marginal moisture is second to none. Um, the stubble retention ability, um, we just sort of see the work that comes out of the water use efficiency stuff James Hunt's doing. He's still retaining more water where he's keeping the stubble there. You just can't ignore that. We have more dry years in this country than we have wet years. So um, if you keep that stubble there, and, and that's, these, are, these are the things growers are throwing at me. And it's pretty easy to say, oh, look, just burn the stubble and go back to a time seeder. But that's just lazy thinking. It requires a high level of weed management uh, to, the, to the point where some of these growers are now having to have their break crop area at, at 40 to even 50% of their total area, which is um, pretty challenging in terms of profit. IBS herbicide use is not on label for a lot of the discs, and um, you do get variations in disc machines. And I went into a bit of detail in the paper, and I'll acknowledge Barry Haskins for some of his help, particularly the Australian made machines, the, the NDF. Uh, the daybreak and, uh, and the Tobin disc drills, they're trying to get modifications in that will throw a bit of soil so you can sort of have a bit of crop safety. So there is a bit of hope there. But it's all still part of an integrated system and it's agronomy first. So you can't just blame a disc system for a, for a paddock being full of ryegrass. You, you've got to get those numbers down low as we've heard today. Um, it, it, it's just a tool to sow the crop but it just uh, carries a bit more risk than, than the other tools we've used in the past. I'd like to acknowledge all the people involved in this project. Um, ben Beck, John and Brendan Patterson, Brent Alexander, Chug Kennedy. There's an interesting individual. <laughs> anyway, he, he had the disc, disc procedure at Lockhart. Fantastic help. Duncan Lander and Rob Johnson at Grenfell. Tony Single, Nick Amos, Peter Hamlet from Agritech. Um, particularly Tony, who um, put a lot of time into this work and we, we acknowledge his help. But yeah, those people on the ground too, Lachlan Corbell from, from Grenfell, Lachlan Fertilisers, Heidi Gooden at, um, at Lockhart, she helped find the trial site for me. And then again, the, the, uh, the Bayer and Jenner New Farm support and farm link. So um, thank you. Yeah, Tony asked for having um, any, the Arix wheel, which is like a residue manager who goes in front of a single disc. So, no, I don't have any direct experience, but we, um, we are investigating it a bit more this year. We did some last year, we'll do it again this year. So, they throw, they throw obviously, trying to take that hairpinning effect out from the disc and throw a bit of um, soil in between the rows. So, from what we saw last year, it was amazing the difference between 10 inch and 12 inch, just the, the, the better crop safety, the narrow row spacing with the disc on an Arix wheel, which that sort of contravenes what you'd think in a time system. Anyway, it's a work in progress. Greg, how, how, given the complexities of the system, how many times do you feel you have to do the trials to, to, to be more confident, I guess, about some of the recommendations, or will you just evolve it and sort of make decisions about what you're confident about as you go? Yeah, probably just have a set of um, a rules that as you go into a certain situation, like that soil moisture is probably the biggest one, yeah. and some of the herbicides are more dangerous than others, so that sort of goes into the rule book, but um, as I say, Barry Haskins has done this work for five years and uh, there's uh, the work done at Birchip and, and South Australia, so we're sort of, you've got a big pool of data yeah. to draw on, but it's always good if it's in your area. 